So today I want to talk about conceptually the the architecture that goes into something called Mirage OS. Let's talk about that right after this. So Mirage OS is a library operating system that basically constructs unikernels uh, for secure high-performance network applications. And those run across a variety of environments, including cloud computing environments and mobile platforms. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But as always, I got to step back and talk about kind of where all this came from and where does its, uh, where does its roots actually lie and well, I'll describe what unikernels are, but I think I, I think the first thing we need to understand is what what the heck is going on here? Why do we need them? So let's drop back for a minute into the earliest days of computing uh, with some of the earliest computers. So the earliest computers lacked any form of operating system at all. They didn't have one. And in fact, when after I had been on Plato Four, I came. I told you I, I started on a machine that was called the Honeywell H2020. This would have been in the late seventies, early eighties, and yeah, archaic was a, a good word to use after coming down from Plato. But the Honeywell H2020 had no operating system whatsoever. So how the heck did it work? Well. Each user, first of all, had sole use of the machine for some period of time. You know, we would go in and schedule that, hey, I want this for an hour or two or whatever. And the programs were compiled from punch cards. And always in front of that punch card deck, there would be included a piece of system code called an executive. And that executive had to be present in every, uh, every application that was run. And what was an executive? So... Uh, yeah, the executive had just enough code in it to allow uh, the, it, the computer to load and, access, and allow the application to access devices on the computer. The application would then, uh, the executive would then load that application into memory that would start the execution of it. But that was it. It didn't do anything else after that until the program stopped. Once it stopped, it would basically just unload itself and it would be ready for the next job. Uh, or if the application crashed, well, it took the executive with it. They all went down together. Uh, it was one big happy mess. Later, though, as systems became more powerful and, and, and the computers were, had more memory and bit faster processors, we st they started migrating to, instead of incorporating the executive, and a little pieces of system code into each application, it would be better to just create an operating system environment and then have the programs run within that. The, as computers continued to evolve, the operating systems became more sophisticated. Uh, in the early days of operating systems, there weren't any, and I, this was true of Plato as well, I mean, there wasn't a kernel mode and a user mode. So, But systems became more evolved. Things like Multix and Unix and so forth came around with that had separation between the kernel and the user environment, which allowed applications running in user mode to, they could crash independently without taking the system down. So, however, <laughs> the kernel side of the code had to be trusted. And if it crashed, well, well everything went down, right? It, we, it took down the entire environment. So... There was finally a need where the computers were, the additional CPUs were being added to the computer. Well, I remember that one of the earliest meetings with, virt with VMware when I was working for IBM, uh, they came in and they were talking about their system. And I think I made some offhand comment like, oh, so basically what you're doing is delaying the development of parallel applications. And they just looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? But in fact, that was true because with, with the standard applications at the time and trying to run them, you could not fully utilize the CPUs. Go see Amdahl's Law if you want to know why. But uh, yeah, so virtualization came about to do a couple of things. One, uh, I mean, there was definite advantages to virtualization because it divides up the computer into smaller virtual machines, each of which have their own copy of the applications that they're running, but 
they have a downside. They also have to have an operating system installed on them in order to work. Yeah, so you, as you add virtual machines, you add copies of operating systems that this application uh, requires. That could be Windows, that could be Linux, that could be BSD. Uh, all of those could run in a virtualized environment. So, yeah, you would have, you had some issues there in that you had additional overhead. Instead of just having applications running, now you have copies of the operating system and the operating system environment that are being managed by that virtual machine as well. And you have to carve out space and memory and allocate CPUs in order to handle that. So containers came along to try to solve that problem. They came and they divided the computer into even smaller uh, containerized machines. And they used a shared operating system, the one on the host, but each one of them had to have their own set of applications and libraries in order to work. Uh, however, containers come with a downside. Everything comes with a downside, right? So the problem with containers and virtual machines is they're, they're just not optimal for running workloads, today's workloads. So in the 1990s, MIT and the University of Cambridge began working on something they called the unikernel. And they probably redesigned the whole sick bay, too. I know engineers, they love to change things. Why? Well, virtual memory wasted space. You had memory, you had disk, and you had CPU cycles that were being tied up because they had to run their own copy of the operating system in each one of the virtual machines. Containers bring layers of abstraction to the, and that means the application usually has to be adapted for usage in a container. And because containers have more configuration possibilities for resources, it's very easy to misconfigure them. So the folks at MIT and the University of Cambridge started asking one of the more basic questions, hey, what if we just got rid of the operating system altogether? And I think you'll find that uh, as we're going through this today that uh, one of the big contributors to uni unikernels today is Zen, believe it or not. Uh, VMware is also working on one. Uh, I think it was called Bombardier. I don't. That was this code name. I don't know what it's called now. Kind of lost track of what they're doing. But there are other variants of this type of a system. Uh, Amazon has one called Firecracker. Google has one called Gvisor. There's also Kata. The unikernels they felt were the next logical step in the progression from virtual machines over to containers. Right. So. So what's a unikernel anyway? What the heck is it? Okay, we get all this we get all this far into the video and you still don't know what one is. So basically it takes pre-built libraries that are in binary and these are highly specialized. They're single address uh, space machine images that are constructed by using this library operating system to create an application which is self-contained. Uh, it has just enough of operating system in order to run. Does this sound like an executive? Yeah, it sort of is, but it's better, all right? So it's better. But unikernels provide developers with the components that they can pick and build the minimal hardware interface layers that their applications need. Plus, they have the added advantage that I can, I can configure when I'm doing building up my runtime for the unikernel, I can configure where it's going to run. I can run it on a traditional Linux environment if I want. I can conf and take that same code that I wrote and simply reconfigure it to run in a hypervisor. Or I can reconfigure it to run uh, somewhere else, maybe in Zen, uh, maybe in Cubes, for example. I can even do that. So more simply stated, uh, unikernels employ only the needed functions to make an application work and nothing more. So it's a very minimalist part. One of the one of the advantages, I think, one of the hype that some of the hype that I've heard is, how would you like to be able to launch your application in your containers and virtual machines in microseconds or milliseconds versus minutes sometimes to bring up an entire virtual machine platform? It can. It can take minutes. Depends on all the things that it has to do in order to make the application come up. But the unikernels start up very fast uh, because of their size and speed. They're very small. More simply stated, uh, uh, a unikernel employs only the needed functions to make an application work and nothing more. Unikernels offer uh, basically higher level of performance, which is what we we're talking about. They have a lot less overhead. 
But the main advantage to them is they improve security by removing things like multi-user access, multiple address spaces, and a lot of them remove remote access altogether. Yeah. So even if you even if you could get access to the machine, you have no way to get to the app to make any changes. So unikernels have to have a downside, right? I mean, there's always a downside. There's always issues. So some of the issues that unikernels have, and, and I will be addressing these later in future videos, but I'm going to try to build this up for you. So, and so today we're at kind of the 30,000 foot level, and then we'll drill all the way down into Mirage OS, and I'll even do... Uh, an example for you and show you how to actually generate your own unikernel, deploy it both on you on Linux as well as deploying it on a hypervisor or in a hyper in a hypervisor environment. Producing unikernel images is complicated and it requires deep knowledge on the subject. The current application framework has to adapt and the product documentation on has to be developed for the usage in unikernel so you know, what things you can modify and what things you can't in the runtime. The lack of, the other part is the lack of safety certified unikernels for mission critical ap applications is another issue. What about comparing them to traditional operating systems? So first of all, unikernels only run in user mode. There is no kernel mode available to them. On traditional operating systems, kernel mode are res is reserved for highly trusted functions of the operating system. And since the and the kernel if the kernel mode crashes well the entire system goes with it but unikernels don't have operating system code they are relying on the hypervisor this code to do that so they're relying on the hypervisor for example to do all of that or on the host operating system if i'm running this under under linux so they run in user mode, and that means that the executing code has no ability to directly access hardware or even reference memory. There has to be somebody offering that service for it. So it's either going to be a Linux kernel itself, if you're building in a kernel environment, uh, in a Linux environment, or if you're building in a hypervisor environment, it has to be the hypervisor that does that for you. What about, uh, what else does it do? So hardly, <laughs> I mean... Hardly a week goes by that we have some kind of report of a cyber attack on critical infrastructure or an enterprise or a federal site. I mean, pick one. And part of the problem that we have is, is that I've talked about this before, is the applications that we have are built up from other libraries. Of course, we want to use things that we don't have to develop. That's the whole idea, right? But some of these are really large and they're really complicated. And as we saw with OpenSSL, we continue to have to find issues with them. We even find issues in the Linux kernel three, four, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, where we discover things. They're just getting too large uh, and too complex to try to identify all the, all the security issues that are in them until it's too late, until somebody breaks it. So operating systems with multi-user, multi-programming, that's the point of weakness and also a point of failure as we are quickly learning. Unikernels, the things that they're not good at is they don't handle resource allocation and that function is handed off to either Linux or to the hypervisor. All system specific system calls are pushed as close to the application as possible. So. Uh, now, it has an upside and it has a downside. So, uni now, unikernels use type 1 hypervisors. There is no helper OS present in them whatsoever. I mean, they're essentially an executive, right? Just enough to load itself, get itself running, and then tear down and go away. So, it is a single process, single user environment. Yep, we've been there before. Um, and there's no way to for the to in those environments in a unikernel to start, to stop, to inspect a process, or even to use interprocess communication. Now there are ways that you can do that, but that you have to call out to something that's going to handle those for you. So there is no multi-user auth authentication or authorization. Uh, there's no resource allocation that's done. So those security uh, points in the 
uh, vulnerability uh, sphere or the, the uh, footprint of your system that might be vulnerable, they don't exist. They're not there. But if this works fine in single purpose applications, so in other words, uni unit kernels work fine in single purpose applications, but maybe not so well in others. So unit kernels are not a one size fits all solution. They're, they, you don't you have to identify the application that you're running for suitability to be a unikernel. There are some that just aren't going to fit that mode, and they can't run in that environment. What about, I mean, there are bare metal development that's done today. So how does that, how does unikernel compare to those? Unikernels can reduce the number of use cases where a bare metal development is needed, but they can't eliminate it. There's always going to be a need for bare metal development, just like there's always going to be a need for containers and hypervisors uh, that are functioning in a traditional virtual machine mode. They're, they're, as long as those applications remain and those use cases remain to support them, you can't eliminate them. We want to reduce the security attack surface. Unikernels work best for applications that require speed, agility, and in increased security and certifiability. Uh, if you look at, by the way, if you look at like uh, uh, Let's Encrypt, they're running on a unikernel. I'm not uh, reckless enough to say, oh, this is the Linux killer. <laughs> no, it, I, I don't see this as replacing uh, traditional operating systems, traditional virtual machines, and traditional containers. Because just as there are, there are use cases where you have to use virtual machines. There are use cases where you, you can use containers. And there are use cases where you can use unikernels. There are use cases for using bare metal applications. The next one we'll be talking about Mirage OS, what its capabilities are, what its functions are, how it works. And then the, the third part will be actually going in and building a unikernel application, uh, deploying it to Linux and deploying it to KVM. So you'll get to see both on how that works. Hope to see y'all next time. Hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see y'all again real soon. Bye for now.